God is everything to me. He's got to be more than you than your mom. Your husband, your wife, your children. Why are you say because it's him you're depending on to keep your children. To keep your wife, to keep your husband.
something totally different when I can stand and give my own testimony yeah, 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 yeah. and be a witness yeah, to how good yeah. God is. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. I'm going to get you to work. But I'm just relishing in the moment. The atmosphere is just right. I felt it in the back.
has kept me my entire life. needed for my household and my family. 
but I'm never wary about tomorrow. Because God has shown me one I might not see tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, right. And I got anxiety today right. about things that have not happened yet. When you think about it like that, it almost sounds crazy. Tomorrow will have its troubles. But what about today's troubles? You don't be worried about something. You don't be worried about
to be a child of God. Talking about being a Christian. Oh, I know. You want to get a new I'm glad to be a son. Often time wondered. What is it that causes a man to come to Christ? Does a man come to Christ because he was raised in the church? that I'm going to attempt to point out. But I don't feel like I'm a druid. But in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, and verse 44, there's a scripture that says, No man can come to me. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent him, which has sent me, excuse me, this is talking now, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Why do men come to God? Or on the flip side of that subject, why don't men come to Christ? sovereignty within his own free will. So far as to believe that if there is a God, if there is a heaven, then I can get there if I so choose. Salvation, by definition, 
simply means the preservation or deliverance from hurt, harm, ruin, or loss. The preservation or deliverance from hurt, harm, ruin, or loss. The definition of the term salvation implies that one who seeks salvation when they discover the reality of being in a situation where they are suffering from harm, hurt, ruin, or loss. One will not seek salvation if they don't feel the need. Amen. You won't say, catch me, unless you know you're falling. Help me, Holy Associated with the phrase come to Christ. We say that often among the Christian umbrella and the Christian church. We tell folk, we go to sinners, we go to the lost, to the unlearned of God. We tell them, come to Christ. Come to Jesus. He stands ready, willing to save you. And the thing is, you would think folk would come flocking. So then I ask the question, why don't they? Have you never wondered? You know, I don't see nobody beating the door down and getting here this morning. Some of you would probably go here this morning. talking to the kids. <laughs> I know none of y'all know. I'm just saying that because I need to be y'all. Amen. But folk ain't flocking to churches and temples across this world. Eh? You would think folk would be running for this salvation. So when I ask the question why, the only conclusion I can draw is that they're ignorant to the fact that they need saving. They're ignorant to that. And you say, well, what do you mean? They can read the Bible just like you did. And what the Bible says about the, the depravity of man deadness of man's spirit yeah. man being born dead and sins and trespasses and Adam being our federal head and Adam being in a fallen state and the condemnation that was put upon the head of Adam has fallen to all of those who came after him sure they can read that and comprehend that just like I can but why did I come running? And they stayed right where they were. Coming to Christ is an act of the soul. It's an act of the soul. Of one denouncing his own self righteousness and putting on the cloak of Christ and his righteousness. Putting on the covering of Christ and of his blood. That's what coming to Christ is. Coming to Christ is 
it implies that you have repented uh -huh. Glory. of your sins. It implies that you have a belief of truth and submission to the will of God in your life. Amen. It is the first effect of regeneration. You say, well, what is regeneration? Regeneration is being born again. When you talk about regenerating, you're talking about making something over anew. You ain't talking about taking the same thing, but something completely different. Regeneration is what Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus in chapter 3 of the Gospel of John. When he said, ye must be born again. Regeneration is what we hope has already taken place before you come up here and say, I want to be baptized. Because if it has not, then all you're doing is getting wet. You just running up my wall here. <laughs> but what we hope and we pray for is that the Holy Spirit has already wrought a change in your heart. And that's what prompted you to get up in the first place. That's what we hope for. But we, we have a, in the text before us today, we have a very hard saying and a difficult doctrine. Actually, Jesus has been, was teaching some difficult doctrine, doctrine from chapter 3 all the way through up to this point. Really all the way through to chapter 11 if you want to be real about it, but... But here in chapter 6, he's familiar with scripture. At the beginning of the chapter, Jesus feeds the 5,000. And he goes across the water towards the Capernaum. I, I, I thought about that for a moment. You keep showing up. Because of what you believe I can do for your flesh. Tell me, Holy Spirit. He's saying, you keep coming to church. You say you believe in me. You say you're one of my followers. But you're only here because of what you believe I can do. For your flesh. So Jesus says, "Since y'all followed me all the way over y'all, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm talking about I went way across the water, and y'all, I, I wake up and there y'all are, yeah. <laughs> looking for more fish yeah. and more bread." Wonder why televangelists have so many followers. Why they can dupe so many to send in money for a prayer call. Some water that they done poured from the tap. Or convince you to give your whole paycheck. And tell you God gonna bless you. Yeah. And if you sow sparingly, you gonna reap sparingly. Yeah. Yeah. You know they gotta give a scripture or something to try to back up what they're saying. God didn't never tell you that. But you wonder how folk can get duped in it. It's because. You have men who are using religion to appeal to people's flesh. Watch out. And it's in a man's nature to feed his flesh. So Jesus said, Well, since you're here, give me the ear. 
And he begins to speak some doctrinal truths to them. And when he gets to verse 44, he tells them, no man can come to me. Not no man will, no man can. He told them no man will in chapter 5. But he said, it ain't even about whether or not you want to or not. I'm telling you, you can't. <laughs> I, 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 I off the back, you gotta believe they didn't understand what in the world Jesus was telling them. What do you mean I can't? I'm here, and I'm here because I want to be here. I'm listening to you because I choose to listen to you. I'm believing in you because I did see your miracles. I saw some of the things you did. I listened to your doctrine and you seem to speak with authority. So yeah, I'm believing in you. What do you mean I can't come to you? Jesus said you can't come to me. Jesus was saying you don't have the capacity. You have an inability to come to me. This is the doctrinal truth that Jesus was telling them. He took advantage of this opportunity to feed their spirit man as opposed to feeding their flesh. They came looking for their flesh to be fed. But Jesus was like, I ain't got nothing for you this morning. I you know, some folks say that coming to Christ is the easiest thing in the world to do. That's what they say. It's the easiest thing for a man to do. But we just read that no, that no man can come to me except the Father draw him. He didn't say the preacher. He didn't say the apostle. The deacon, the teacher, my mama, my daddy. He didn't say my culture, my nationality, none of that. He said they cannot come unless the Father draw him. He said unless the Father draw him. I know that sounds absurd to many of you. I know it does. On the surface, it sounds absurd to me. But I, I, you may even be asking the question and saying to yourself right now, what, what are you talking about? Anyone can be saved if they will. And the thing is, is I would stand and I would say to you, yes, I agree, that's true. Sure they can. But the problem lies in the if they will part. The problem lies in the if they will. Because let's be honest. Who really in your natural condition you don't mind if we get honest for a moment, do you? In your natural condition, want to follow this God. Everything about this God is against your nature. Everything about this God is against the world. Is against worldly lusts and desires. Your mind ain't telling you to follow this God. Let's just be real about it. From the first man, his nature was corrupt. From the first man, he had his own desire to be like God himself. We had the first sin that came out of envy and jealousy. As far as the first murder. Cain killed and Abel, his brother. In man's nature, God said that 
every imagination of man's heart was only evil uh -huh. continuously. It's talking about the nature of man. And man and his natural condition will never seek after God. Amen. Will never seek to live after God, to follow his will and his ways, or to even know him. So I don't doubt that to the carnal mind, this doctrine may have been somewhat offensive to them. Amen. I, I, I'm sure it was because... When I look at verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that the disciples murmured at his teaching. In chapter 6, verse 61, look at that. You don't know I ain't making this up. He said unto them, does this offend you? Because he heard the murmuring. Come on, what is this man talking about? Somebody feed him and show his love. <laughs> Do something. He said, are y'all offended by what I'm telling you? Because my flesh is me indeed. The thing is, is God being spirit speaks by the spirit. So if God speaks and teaches by the Spirit, that means we must comprehend by the Spirit. Amen. See, you can say, I can read this Bible, and by my intellect, I can understand and comprehend what it says in its teachings by the letter. I can understand it by the letter, but without spirit, I will never understand the spirit of it. It's just like the law in the old covenant. The law of God was everything righteous and true. But the law had, had a flaw. And the flaw in the law is what was wrong with it. And man could not see that. Man could not see the spirit of what the law represented. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians. Listen. In 1 Corinthians chapter. Who says chapter 2? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in verse 14. He says. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You wonder why folk think that preaching is foolishness. Folk think that you going to church and folk think that you giving your life and living a certain way that honors God and honors your relationship with God is foolishness. Why are you wasting your time with that mess? It's because you're walking by the Spirit. And the flesh will never understand things of the Spirit. The text says, you know, I don't think Jesus minded that they was offended. Sometimes you need to be offended. I hope sometimes my preaching make you feel unsettled and, and uneasy. Every now and then you say, ouch, a little bit. Of. Get off my street. Because you've been too comfortable. Every now and then you ought to get offended by the word of God. Because when you are offended, it causes you into action. Hallelujah. The 
text says, no man can come to me. Indicating the inability to come. But where does this inability lie? It does not lie in any physical defect. It's not a physical deficiency in coming to Christ. If, if, if in coming to Christ it takes some moving of the body or walking or running of the feet, then, then man has all the physical power necessary to come to Christ. There's no physical inability in that sense. He can walk in the doors of a church just as easy as he can walk in the doors of a clubhouse. If coming to Christ was, was uttering a prayer or partaking, man has no physical defect. God. All that can be wanted as far as a physical bodily strength, man has in this physical stature. Nor is there an inability in man's, in man's mental capacity. There's not a mental deficiency found in man that'll keep him from coming to God. I can believe this Bible is I can believe this Bible is true just as much as I can believe the newspaper be true. Just as much as I can believe green eggs and ham if I want to. But difference is I, I do not lack any type of mental capacity. Because so far as believing in Christ as an act of the mind, I have the mental capacity to believe in him. As I'm able to believe in anybody else. I have the mental capacity to believe in Buddha or Confucius or whoever, Muhammad or whoever I want to. I have the mental capacity to do so. There's no deficiency in the faculty of the mind. There's no deficiency in the faculty of the body. So I lack nothing there. So then where does this inability lie? Where does it lie? It lies in man's very nature. I know I would die. Don't, yeah, I know. Let's be on Facebook. Y'all know me well enough to know I don't care. I know I wouldn't be up here. I wouldn't be in no church. I'd be somewhere having fun. Or what I thought was fun. But I'd be living it up. And rolling all in. I would. See, y'all want to be honest with me. I'm just going to sit next to the family and want people to think about you right there. I'm just going to sit next to the family. Y'all just going to pass and say, you can get a point first. But God stepped in. My nature was all about pleasing me. It was all about what I wanted, what I could get, how much of it I could get, how much I could enjoy it, and it didn't matter who I hurt to get. That was my nature. My nature wasn't looking for God. I was in church, brought up in the church, but I was in church looking at the... I'm talking at 19 years old, man. There ain't never been a time I wasn't looking. I can tell you, I don't know. I'm telling you. I ain't by myself. I was not in church listening to the preacher or even Sunday school. I had to find what I liked about it because I always had to go. And what I like was the girl. <laughs> Sunday school trip. Let's go in front. <laughs> Can we be honest? Take the hand off and get the home. <laughs> My nature was not looking for Jesus. <laughs> Even in church. 
My dad was a pastor. They said when you pick that from where it's wrong, it makes it worse. I don't know. But I wasn't looking for Jesus. And if you be honest, neither were you. Even though you was in church Sunday morning. See, some of y'all thinking about where you was at last night. And you were in there Sunday morning. You might be in there for the right reason, but somebody's in there this morning because they knew you was going to be there. It's over. 
no matter how tamed you might think it be, and it ain't the lion or the wolf's fault. Because it's in their nature to be a wolf. No man, no more can a man go from sinner to being saint. You didn't just decide to grow, wake up today and be a saint. You didn't wake up today and say, oh, I'm going to go get right with Jesus. I'm going to follow God. You might have said it. You might have tried. You might have stepped out there. But it wasn't too long before you faltered along the way. Man has an inability in his nature. And his nature has a direct impact on his will. Stop thinking that your will is totally free. You don't have absolute free will. Because your will is only going to choose what's in your nature to choose. It's only going to choose what's in your heart to choose. That's what Christ meant when he said, you have an inability to come to me. He told him in chapter 5. He told him in chapter 5. He said, you will not come to me that you might have life. How can Christ make such statements? How can he make such statements? You will not come to me that you might have life. In other words, you will never want to come to me in and of yourself. And then not only does he say that, but then he gets to birth to chapter 6 and he says, you cannot. Because of that inability, it affects your will as well. And your will is darkened in its understanding. I told you, you might understand scripture by the letter, but you can't understand the spirit of it without the spirit of God in you. What Jesus was telling Nicodemus in chapter 3, he told him, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at how the spirit of God works. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is old? At the end of the second time in his mother's womb, he said, really, I said, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He said, the wind bloweth where it listed, and thou hearest the sound, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit of God. That's why he says, you can't come to me unless it is given to you by the Father. Unless the Father draws you unto me. But then who and how does the Spirit work? In regards to that drawing. Because I can't. But my brother did. You can't. But your best friend did. You've been bringing your children. But your son doesn't convert to Islam. But you brought them up in the church. Their whole life. What's going on? What is it? How did they stray yeah, Lord. from the truth? Well. How come they don't accept this truth the same way I accepted it and came running? What must I do to be saved? Amen. Amen. I told you last week when we looked at Galatians chapter 4, I said that because you are sons, uh -huh. God sent forth his spirit into your heart. The Spirit seeks out His children. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And I know what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. You're saying, so I'm a child before I'm a child? I'm a child before I know I'm a child? I belong to God before He sent His Spirit? I'm telling you, because you belong to God, is why he sent his spirit. Yeah. Yes. Because of election. Uh -huh. 
Because God promised his son a kingdom and a people. And God promises his son a people. He died a definite death for a definite purpose for a definite people. Why did you come? Because you were elected. See, you want to, don't, 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 don't. Don't take for granted how you got here. It's not an accident that you was raised in the church. Thank God you was raised in the church. It wasn't an accident that that person stumbled upon you and witnessed unto you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be grateful for that. It ain't an accident that you happened to show up today because you wanted to see that girl that you saw last night. Because you just might be hearing something that'll cause you to come back tomorrow. You might say, you know what, that church, I like that choir, they was jumping over there. I'm going to come on back and see them next week. And then you come on back next week, and then you leave, and then the following week, you're like, you know what, that pastor said some real stuff. I'm going to come on back next week. And then all of a sudden, you don't know, win about a suit. <laughs> so then what's fine that for? Because I... I've been going to this church and I'm going to go in there because I want to feel like I belong. And you wonder what's going on and friends may be starting to talk like, man, I ain't seen you like I used to see you. And you don't know what it is, but God and his spirit has been drawing you from the beginning. Because some truth is going forward and it ain't no telling because the Holy Spirit just might hook you. He must draw me. You say, how do I know if I'm hooked? How do I know that I have the Spirit? How do I know that I'm a child of God? If when you came to Jesus, if you came because you saw yourself as a sinner, if you came because you saw what you deserve in the eyes of God, if the Holy Spirit revealed to you what that remedy is, because if he revealed to you that you was lost and that you was a sinner, that he also revealed to you that you can't save yourself. I, I, I don't think I've ever heard a believer, at least not a true believer, say that I saved myself. Say I did it on my own. I cleaned myself up. And got right with the Lord. You the lie. For one, there ain't that much clean that you can do. You can't get that clean. To come and present yourself before God. You're still, I don't care if you wash yourself with bleach, ivory, leaves, or everything else. You will still smell a filthy rag. But the spirit of God <laughs> understands spiritual things. And he will show you not only that you need him, but that he is the only one that can save you. And you'll come running saying, I surrender all. I give it all to him. See, that's how you can worship God, just for being God. 
That's how you can love him even when you're hurting. That's how you can stand for him when nobody else is even willing to stand with him. And you stand all by yourself. Being talked about. Made fun of. Ostracized. Marginalized. Left alone. And you can say, for God I live. And for God I die. I don't need you to worship God. I know what he's done for me. I understand the mercy that he has rendered unto me. By the blood of the cross. You got to see the cross. See, in that song where it says, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the what? The birth of my heart was running hell. The burden of knowing that I should be gone and cast into the fire. But at the cross, my burdens had to roll away. I ain't worried about where I'm going when my time is up. I ain't got no question about where I'm going when I take my last breath. I'm like Paul. I'm torn between the two. For to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I ain't worried about that. I don't have that burden. That's for you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, the thing is, if you don't know that to be a burden, you need to ask yourself the question. Do I really have his spirit? I'm going to say it again. The spirit will lead you and guide you into all truth. And the truth is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin, what you have earned is hell and condemnation. You want God to give you what you deserve? I don't. I want God to give me mercy. I need mercy. I need him to withhold what I deserve. And give me some grace. I need your mercy. But then I need you to give me some grace. I need you to give me some of what I don't deserve. So I can continue to walk this journey. Amen. So I can look forward to that great good morning. Yes, yes. When I'm going home to be with the Lord. Yes, no man can come to me. Unless the Father. Yes, draw him. Yes. Has God. Drawn you to him. Has he imparted his spirit unto you. Do you know that you know what you deserve and what God has given you in his son? Come to Jesus. Come on, brother. No man can come to me. Don't give yourself that much prayer. Salvation is holy of all of God. You have nothing to do with it. So if you don't get any credit, you don't get any glory, it all belongs to him. He put the plan together. He executed and implemented. And then he even worked in you. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. 
Not only did he give you the want to, but he gave you the power.